all-out winter warfare on the Eastern Front. We're in a trench with Ukrainian paratroopers. They fire on Russian positions using AKs and a U.S.-supplied Browning heavy machine gun. They're searching for weak spots in our position, says the commander, call sign Ghost. They want to see if we fight back. If we show strong resistance, though, they don't advance. And this is what strong resistance looks like. The Russians are only about 400 yards away, hidden in the snow and fog, but constantly firing at the entrenched Ukrainians. The enemy uses all kinds of weapons, Bogdan says, small arms, heavy machine guns, artillery, mortars, rocket launchers, and aviation as well. But so far, the Ukrainians say they haven't lost an inch of territory here. The Ukrainians say the situation here is reminiscent of some of the worst times in World War II, where they're not only fighting a strong adversary, but the elements as well. The snow, the mud, and the cold make fighting here even tougher. And Ukraine's leadership believes the Russians will soon escalate even more after mobilizing hundreds of thousands of men for a likely spring offensive. But this gunner, who goes by the name Deputy, says the paratroopers are ready. It will be hard, he says, it will be tough, but we will hold because we stand here for our land. If we don't do it, nobody will. There's a visceral hatred towards Moscow's leaders among these men. In Russia, they have a terrorist dictatorial regime, Bogdan says. So now the civilized world is fighting against this wild medieval dictatorship. As we prepare to leave, incoming grenades explode above. Yeah, let's go. And this, the men say, is a relatively quiet day. They expect much worse in the months to come, but their motto is, if not us, who else? And Aaron, that is the reality on the ground there and in so many other places on Ukraine's eastern front. And you were mentioning the Ukrainian defense minister saying he believes that up to 500,000 people could have already have been mobilized by the Russians. In every single place that we've been going to on the eastern front here in Ukraine, they have been telling us, the Ukrainians, that they believe that the Russians have already beefed up their forces. And certainly the Ukrainian government today said that they believe that the month of February and the month of March are going to be extremely tough for the Ukrainians on the ground. They obviously say they need more Western weapons to hold their ground, but they also say, of course, they are not going to give up an inch of their territory without a fight, Aaron. Fred, thank you very much. It's an incredible report. And I want to bring in now to talk about it, Ekaterina Kodrakazi, the news director and anchor for TV Rain, which is an independent Russian language television channel shut down by the Russian government at the start of the war. Also with me, retired Army Brigadier General Mark Kimmett, a former Assistant Secretary of State for Political and Military Affairs. Thanks to both. General Kimmett, let me begin with you, because you hear Fred, the Ukrainian troops he's speaking to, uh, you know, they say today was a quiet day. A quiet day, as we just heard the, the nonstop, uh, right, artillery in the distance, the grenades exploding uh, overhead as he was leaving. And the defense minister of Ukraine is saying that Russia's already mobilized 500,000 soldiers, that they're seeing them amass on these borders again. Do you think that we're about to see a big change in this war? Well, I really don't. I think we may see a big change in this war in a couple of months. But as the soldiers said, this is very much like World War II. No. In fact, this is like World War I, the trench warfare in France uh, that went on for years and years. Uh, unfortunately, I think in the near term, we're going to see much the same for the next couple of months until one side or the other prepares for a counteroffensive. That's why we got the tanks. That's why we're bringing in the tanks so the Ukrainians have a chance. Uh, and the Russians may have plans on their own, but I certainly hope we're interdicting their lines to make sure the majority of these troops never show up. Katerina, you know, you pointed out to us that soundbite we played of, you know, sort of the the most prominent Russian state media television anchor, right, threatening that if the Russians don't win, it's nuclear World War III. And you're pointing out that a lot of the Putin TV commentators on state media are backing more action. They really are upping the rhetoric right now. Let me play how another prominent TV host put it. Why the f*** would our state build up a stockpile of strategic and tactical nuclear missiles? Why? Just to be afraid of using them? Katerina, what do you read into that? And what does the Russian public really think at this point? 
this was Vladimir Solovyov, one of the biggest stars of Russian propaganda, uh, Erin. Actually, the situation right now is dangerous for Vladimir Putin. As we can see, they don't have any other, uh, any other tools to use for Russian public and for the Western world, except for the threats. They are threatening the world with this World War III, with the nuclear weapon, because this is the last hope that they can catch right now and offer the world. The um, attitude of people in Russia is, is fear, actually. The society is terribly depressed. People understand that this is the war, actually, that this is not a special military operation, how they called it before. Vladimir Putin is already calling this a war, and Sergei Lavrov, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, and others, they're not hiding anymore that this is a very serious situation, and people are understanding it right now. So this is the new stage for Russian society. And they can hear this words about the nuclear weapon. I know that people are scared to death. They don't want this nuclear war, of course, because they, they don't want to die. They want to, uh, you know, raise the, their children and, and so on and so forth. So they are looking for some kind of, you know, um, maybe kind, uh, soft moment. They're looking forward to maybe freezing this this war because this is the only way to survive for Russian citizens. They yeah. don't know how to see the future without Vladimir Putin because he has built a terrible repressive state where no one has the right to think freely or to talk freely, yeah. as you know. So General Kimmet, you know, a well-known and highly respected Russian analyst said this about the current state of the Russian military in the context of what Ekaterina just said. Here it is. By the start of the mobilization, our airborne forces lost 40 to 50 percent of the staff. Look, it's an incredible admission, right, happening on one of those very same programs, General, so I, I do want to emphasize that. Uh, but to say something like that, that nearly half of Russia's airborne forces are gone, I mean, it's stunning. But then I think about what the Ukrainian defense minister said today, that Russia has 500,000 more soldiers coming. General, what is the real picture here? Well, I think the real picture is quantity has a quality all its own. Uh, if they are going to be pouring 500,000 troops in, that's going to make a significant difference no matter how many tanks we give, no matter how much artillery they have. But I wouldn't put too much stock in what the defense minister said. There, mm. There's an old saying in the military, the first report is usually wrong. And that seems like an awful large number to anybody that's been following this for some time. It certainly does. I mean, you heard it today and sort of said, wait a minute, it, it, it wasn't the math that we'd heard of the mobilization or, or anything, but, but it is a stunning number. Uh, Ekaterina, you have extensively covered Putin opposition leader Alexei Navalny. Uh, he is in the news today, his lawyer saying that he is being transferred to even harsher solitary confinement. He, of course, is the opposition leader in Russia and uh, was poisoned by Putin's men and then put into a penal colony. Sometimes he's able to pass messages to his team and then they post them on Twitter. Today that happened. And this was posted, quote, when something like this happens to you, you realize how important it is to fight this unscrupulous regime, how important it is to do just about anything in order to throw the yoke of these scoundrels off Russia and dispel the illusion that they have planted in the heads of millions. Let us try to remain strong and do all we can every day. And yet he physically seems weaker every time we get an image of him, Ekaterina, and as I, I said today, going to even harsher solitary confinement. What happens if he doesn't survive? It's going to be a huge problem for Vladimir Putin because he has already tried to kill him, and we know that, but it was a different time. Right now, when the level of fear and depression in Russian society is so high, when everyone is at the edge, when mobilization is something that people are scared very much, and you know we know that because we can see how, much, how many people watch us, and millions of Russians are asking questions about mobilization in particular. So Navalny, his death, if it happens, um, I mean, it, it's terrible, but if it happens, can be a huge trigger for Russian people to go out on the streets and to protest and to change something. I don't want this to happen, of course, and no one wants this to happen. And Putin doesn't want it to happen. So that's why 
they're not killing him in jail. This is the only good news for Alexei Navalny and for the for the civil society of Russian Federation, which survives out of Russia, unfortunately, right now. So yes, he's in a terrible circumstances. They're trying to break his personality, his stamina, but he is proving every single day, Erin. If you look at him, and if you look what he says, what he writes, what he tweets with the help of his lawyers, you can see how strong this person is. Yeah. And I, I am sure that he survives, actually. All right, Katerina, thank you very much. General Krimit, thanks to you.